Hey, this is Mark at the Motor City Nightmares 2021. I'm here with Daniel Roebuck. He's a great actor. I first came across him in the movie The River's Edge. Tell me, how, how did you get started getting into acting? Well, I started in community theater in the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania uh, and uh, moved to Hollywood in 1984 and ended up in my first movie in 1984 starring in a movie called Cave Girl. Uh, and then, like, it was really, Mark, nowhere to go but up after Cave Girl. Uh, so, uh, second movie was River's Edge. Okay. Now, I remember you were in The Fugitive with Tommy Lee Jones and Harrison Ford. How was, like, how was that working with those great actors? Well, uh, I wonder, do you ever think, I wonder if anybody's asking Harrison Ford, you were in The Fugitive with Tommy Lee Jones and Daniel Roebuck. What was it like working with those great actors? Uh, for me, it was uh, marvelous. In the first place, I was a big fan of the uh, David Jansen show, so to end up in the movie was great. To be with those great actors was superb. I've, I've, I've been very blessed in my life to every five or six years, I end up in the thing that everybody loves. Like I end up in The Fugitive, in The Late Shift, in Lost, in Man in the High Castle, and. Whatever the thing is, I end up in it. You got that face that casting directors love. I, I hope so. And I, I'm like, I'm a, just a regular guy. You know what I mean? So I look like a regular guy. Making my own movies now, and i like to talk about that if I could for a second. Sure. Please go to a channelofpeace.org. A channel of peace. Like, make me a channel of your peace. A channelofpeace.org. Uh, we're making faith-based family movies. See, I, I'm happy to be in all the horror movies I'm in, and I'm in all the Rob Zombie movies. And But uh, as a, a man uh, who's trying to live a faithful life, I think it's important that we give people finally something else. Everything coming out of Hollywood is superheroes or horror. Yeah. And they're not just getting regular people solving regular problems. We don't need Superman. We need a higher power. You're trying to make the world right. I'm trying to just, well, I'm trying to... I'm just trying to give people an alternative to bad news all the time, all the time. It's depressing. Yeah, dude, and I like, like, look, dude, I love horror movies. The classic horror movies are my favorite. I've even collected on it as a collector. But given an opportunity to make my own movies, I don't need to make horror movies because there's talented people all around us doing that. But there's not enough movies that a family could watch together. I've got a movie on Hulu right now called Getting Grace perfect example of a movie a family could sit down and watch together. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, t tell me, did you have any reservations in playing Jay Leno? No, no, I was honored to play Jay Leno. Honored to play him. And and thank God I played the nice guy. You know, John Michael Higgins, the great actor who played David Letterman, you know, had to be humiliated on public TV by David Letterman because evidently being rich and being in control wasn't enough for David Letterman. He had to, he had to take something out on an actor, like a great actor like John Michael Higgins. He should have kissed John's behoogan for doing such a good job in the movie. Anyway, not a fan of David Letterman. Big fan of Jay Leno. No, did, obviously Jay saw the movie. Did he talk to you about the? Uh, yeah, he he really did like what I did. Yeah, you gave some humanity to that movie. Yeah, and Jay's, I mean, Jay is humanity. Anybody can watch Jay's Garage or whatever. See, he's a regular guy. Yeah. Like, I live in Burbank. His cars are in Burbank. You know, you bump into Jay on the street. You bump into him at, at the restaurant. He always has a moment to talk to everybody. He's a very good person. Nice so awesome. it was great to be able to play the good person. Okay, Danny, what do you have coming down the pipeline? Is there something that... Oh, yeah, so much, I mean, a lot of really great stuff. Unfortunately, some of it I can't talk about, but the blessings continue in my world. So a lot of good stuff coming at you in 2022. Plus, if people do go to a channel of peace, they'll see uh, we've got a movie I made that I directed with my daughter, co-wrote and co-directed, oh, wow. a movie called Lucky Louie. And we're currently shooting the Hail Mary. I jumped out here for two days to meet people in Detroit. Then I'm going back to finish the Hail Mary. Is this your first time here in Detroit? I know I've been in Detroit before, first time at Motor Cities, and it's a great convention put on by wonderful people, wonderful people. 
That's cool. Well, it was a pleasure speaking with you, Danny. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you. I'm a big fan of actors. Thank you. And so this is Mark at the Motor City Nightmares. Hey, this is Mark at the Motor City Nightmares 2021. I'm here with legendary filmmaker John Russo. He was one of the guys behind the making of the classic Night of the Living Dead, and he's done plenty of other cool horror movies. Tell me, sir, how you, how you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. So how did you get started into filmmaking? Well, I always wanted to be a writer. We had a group of friends, including George Romero. We all met when we were 18 years old. George came to Pittsburgh to go to Carnegie Mellon University, which used to be Carnegie Tech. He was a fine arts major, and his first day there, he met my friend Rudy Ritchie. We both graduated from the same high school, and Rudy said, you have to meet this great guy, George Romero. He said, we're supposed to be drawing the nude model, and he's drawing scenes from Ben-Hur. <laughs> so I said, oh, great. So I was at WVU, and I came back for Christmas and uh, jumped in Rudy's car and we drove to George's place in the Oakland section of Pittsburgh, honked the horn. George came down to the street wearing a big sombrero, uh, two bandoleros of ammunition, two pistolas, and a big drooping black mustache and he got in the car. We, did, we were so cool, we didn't say a word, drove to a Dairy Queen tried to get ice cream but the girl slammed the window shut and wouldn't wait on us <laughs> so eventually we all wanted to do creative things and uh, eventually we started making movies which George had already been doing before he left New York now how did the script for Night of the Living Dead come come about it's a little bit of a long story but uh, I came up with the idea as soon as we bought a 35 millimeter camera I said let's make a movie let's we can probably do a better horror film than those uh, junky things we've been seeing on Chiller Theater late at night and we raised a little bit of money from friends and family and finance companies and we got it started and I said uh, George and I were the two writers in the company we only had six people in our little company, The Late Image, and I, I said, whatever we do ought to start in a cemetery, because cemeteries people find spooky. Mm -hmm. So I started writing a thing about, uh, eventually, after some hits and misses on some things that we found we couldn't afford with, like, space aliens coming to Earth and all that stuff. I started writing a thing where some kids are in a cemetery. One of them's wearing a ghoul mask. It's Halloween time. They stole a case of beer and they're hiding it. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, they get caught. And the one kid gets punished and runs away from home. And he's running through the woods with his few belongings. And crack, he steps through a pane of glass in the ground. Underneath that pane of glass is a rotting corpse. So my idea was the aliens are already here. They like human flesh and they like it a little bit rotten. <laughs> Just like in the Middle Ages uh, when they shot a goose, they'd hang it up to rot for a few days. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there, there, there's lots of panes of glasses with corpses under them. So then George came in and he had written about 20 pages or 30 pages of a, of a in story form about a girl and her brother in a cemetery and the girl's getting chased after the brother gets his head smashed and and I read it and I said George you know this is pretty good it has all the right twists and turns and suspense but who's chasing this girl you never say and he said I don't know I said well seems to me they could be dead people he said that's good I said but what are they after you don't say that either and he said I don't know I said why don't we use my flesh eating idea so that's how they became dead people after human flesh. Without those ideas, you don't have Night of the Living Dead or anything that came after it. So you and George were the perfect combination to come up with this script. Yeah, we, we kind of were like that, even with commercial jobs and different documentaries and things that we wrote. And I, I was always like an idea man, and I still am, you know. I'll come up with ten ideas to everybody else's one. That's just the way I am. Now, during the production of the movie, how long did it take to make it? 
Night of the Living Dead, well, to make it, like any movie, it took months to shoot it. We, we shot in about 30 days in three bursts. And uh, the first burst was 19 days at the farmhouse with a break to try to satisfy our commercial clients. And then back again, we had to go to Washington, D.C., which was also my idea. Let's just, let's just go to Washington, D.C. and shoot. Oh, that was, a, that was a great insert into the movie. Well, we drove there in one day because we didn't have any money. We drove in one day, shot it without any permission at all, which you'd get arrested or shot if you tried it today. And then and we drove back all in one day because Washington, D.C. is about 250 miles from Pittsburgh. So I said in a meeting, I said, let's just go there. So I got into my Army uniform, and I was the general's driver. Carl Hardman had a car that uh, looked like it could be a general's car and decked it out with flags and so on. And Al, Al McDonald played the general. He had to change clothes on the sidewalk. By that time, we had all kinds of people gathered around the camera and we held up blankets and he changed it into the uniform. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a really cool scene. Now, tell me, what have you been doing since Night of the Living Dead? I know you're a writer and I know you've made a lot of independent what films. Been doing? You've been what? doing a lot. Just give us like the, the, the top what stuff. What have I been doing? I've, been, I've got far, about 40 published novels and uh, I've made a, about 15 feature films and tons of uh, documentaries and commercials and every other kind of thing, published magazines, published books, and I'm still doing, going. I'm directing a movie right now, well, I'm not actively directing yet because we're in pre-production with a film called Red Tide Massacre, which is going to be shot in L.A. and also in Florida. So and the reason I'm here is because the schedule got moved. I wasn't supposed to be here, but the schedule got bumped a little bit. And I got here, you know, came here at the, I got in touch with Tommy, who runs this convention, and she said, yeah, I'll, get, I'll always give you a table. <laughs> so here I am. You're one of the last guys from that Leighton Image group that's still with us. I mean, that's got to be heartbreaking to be, you know, lose all your friends from that era. I know Russ is still with us. Well, Russ and I, we're still friends. I, you know, I talked to him before I left, but... Uh, I wouldn't say it's heartbreaking. I mean, at George's funeral in Toronto, I, you know, I, I, I shed tears and I spoke at his funeral. But thing is, nobody lives forever. Hemingway had a friend that, whenever they heard about a friend of theirs that died, and, and, the, and Hemingway's friend said, "There's people dying this year that never died before." So I say that sometimes, and uh, not necessarily when a friend dies, but I will. Quip. I'm the one that makes people laugh when we're on stage. So, in fact, I have a book here with my jokes in it called John Russo's Dirty Jokes. <laughs> we got to check that out. Well, anyways, Mr. Russo, we don't want to take up too much of your time, but it was a pleasure speaking with you as always. All right, thanks. Good luck. And this is Mark with Comics Beer and Sci Fi. Hey, this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares 2021. I'm here with Courtney Gaines. You might recognize this guy. He's been in all these cool movies like Children of the Corn, Back to the Future, and The Burbs. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Tell me, how did you get started in acting? Uh, well, I got the bug at like 10 years old the first time I did a play. And I hit the boards and I just knew that was what I wanted to do with my life. My first big break was Children of the Corn. Um, I started studying with this guy named Virgil Fry when I was about 13, and he was a professional actor, and he really taught me the craft and became a manager and broke me into the business. What director you've worked with in the past that you found that you love the best? Yeah, I, I hate when people ask, like, the, which the one director you loved, or what's the best role? It's hard to say that, but uh, one of the people I enjoyed a lot was uh, was the director in Memphis, Bell. Um, is, I like because he was Michael Caton Jones. Thank you, Michael Caton Jones. It's because he was Scottish, and you knew just by the way he said "cut" whether he liked to take or not. It'd be like if he didn't like it, be like "cut," you know. And if it was good, he'd be like "cut," you know. He, I like he knew exactly where he stood at all times. If he didn't like it, he'd be like, "come on, guys, you can do better than that. Come on," you know. I love that. I love be like be real with you, be honest, say what you want, you know. But I mean, you know, I mean, I've worked with other talented, maybe a lot crazier people like Dennis Hopper, but you know, I mean. With, talented as hell right so 
So when you worked on Back to the Future, did you work on any of the parts where Eric Stoltz was in? Um, I think I did. Uh, the, the, the first day where I'm kicking him down the hall, I think that, you know, that um, Marty and, and, and uh, I can't think of anything to fucking name. My brain is gone. Uh, well, you know, well, no, but no, I'm kicking George. No, but uh, uh, with, with the doc, they're off on the side watching the whole thing, right? I think Eric Stolz worked that day because what happened was um, after he got, he, he got fired, they, they had to keep me on payroll because I had already worked and been let go once before and after that they can't do that again so while they were reshooting they forgot about me and I got paid for like five weeks for a job that I was supposed to work like three days so it was one of the it's still the biggest financial blessing because the residuals that you get for Back to Future still plays on TV all the time so it's been a total blessing what was your favorite character to play in movies yeah see you did it again What's the one character? Pick your favorite child. It's, it's hard to say what your favorite character is. Uh, it really is. Uh, Obviously, your most famous is, is Malachi. Yeah, that's for sure. Tony the Corn character, Malachi, probably the most famous. But, uh, I mean, some of them have been television. I did a, a diagnosis murder where I was a guy who was pretending to be paralyzed on the left side, and or, or left, he is paralyzed on the left side, pretending to have cerebral palsy on the other. I had a week to prepare that and pulled that off. Uh, I did a Criminal Minds a few years back that was very, very challenging. Homeless guy, PTSD, all these interesting things. So it's not always the films that sometimes give you the, the juiciest characters. Even My Name is Earl, that, will, that was a great role. What were some of your memories working on the set of The Burbs? Well, Number one thing that stands out was that we were doing it during the writer's strike. So we were, it was us and Fletch, too, were the only movies on the entire Universal lot. And then we shot nights, so basically it was mainly just us. So that was kind of weird. It was like a ghost town, you know. Um, and then, you know, the challenging thing was everywhere I looked, I'm supposed to be this, you know, stranger from a strange land. Everywhere I look, are like people I grew up watching, you know what I mean? I mean, I was a big Bruce Stern fan. You know, obviously Tom Hanks, Carrie Fisher. So I had to keep shaking that off. Like, I don't know these people. I don't know Henry Gibson. I didn't see him as a child, you know, watching him on Laugh-In or the Blues Brothers, you know. That was the challenge. What do you have coming down the pipeline? Uh, actually, a bunch of things because now the COVID, sort of COVID semi-over, all of a sudden they're doing all these movie pushes. So all these things I've done the last few years are coming out. One is a movie called uh, Queen Bees that I just have a cameo in, but I got to work with Jane Curtin. Loretta Devine, uh, Anne Margaret, and Ellen Bernstein in a scene. So I wasn't passing that up, so I had a ball doing that. Uh, another movie just got released called River. It's a psychological sci-fi project. Um, a horror movie called Await the Dawn just came out on Amazon Prime. And a movie called Charming the Hearts of Men comes out on August 13th. Now, do you keep in, getting back to Children of the Corn, do you keep in contact with any of the the actors you worked with in that movie? In general, I'm pretty bad at it, but John Franklin and I, because, you know, it was both our first film and to have it be that movie, and we do conventions and things, we've always kept in touch. So he's, out of, out of everybody, he's the one. Well, it was a pleasure speaking with you, Courtney. All right, thank you. And this is Mark at the Motor City Nightmares.